Mike Green, I'm here for Real Vision, sitting at home in Marin, hoping soon to get out. But I am really excited to, to invite one of my uh, long-term uh, you know, uh, man crushes on Jeremy Grantham of Grantham Mail Van Otterloo has played an incredibly important role in, in my career. He was actually a uh, uh, limited in my first investment firm. And you've been unique in this industry in terms of your ability to sit astride multiple bubbles and cycles. Jeremy, welcome to Real Vision. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, pleasure to be here. So today we're going to try and talk about a bunch of stuff. Um, one of the ways that I'd love to start this out is let's just talk a little bit about background. As I mentioned, you and I know each other from my first firm, Moody Aldrich Partners, where you um, had been instrumental in the founding of that, actually contributing um, much of the capital and the opportunity there. There's a number of stories that I know from that about the startup of GMO, and I'd love to uh, kind of run those through. My favorite story, of course, is that when you launched GMO, um, you went through such a period of lean times that despite the fact that you were a rabid Celtics fan, uh, you would limit yourself to purchasing one copy of the Boston Globe a week so that you could actually read about the Celtics without drawing down uh, on the resources that you had preserved. Is this a true story? It's entirely true with one caveat, and that is that was our first firm of Battery March. Uh, oh, okay. We founded in 69 uh, with, uh, with Dean LeBaron. And that really was poverty <laughs> writ large. Uh, and uh, I sold my interest in that. So I did have a little bit of money set aside for uh, starting GMO. Now, that, that actually takes us back. So that's perfect. Um, Battery March was one of the very first in the quantitative space. You were al along, uh, you mentioned Dean LeBaron. You know, you were among the very first to introduce the idea of using mainframe computers to quickly and efficiently create large baskets or large portfolios of securities, as I remember correctly, if, if I remember correctly. Is that an accurate description? And maybe you could give me a little bit of background on how you became interested in quantitative analysis as it related to portfolio construction, and then how that led to the creation or the start of GMO. We started GMO because uh, basically we fell out with uh, our senior partner, Dean LeBaron. And um, that, that's business as usual. It happens in, in, in yep. different partnerships. And um, in terms of uh, quantity, we, uh, we were value managers. We tried to do rigorous analysis. We adopted a fairly strict dividend discount model. And in the early days, we did it by hand. In the next phase, we did it by... Uh, those wonderful little Texas instrument calculators with little metallic strips where we write in simple dividend discount programs. And, and then finally, we made it up to, um, to large mini computers of the prime, now extinct along with the digital equipments. They came and went very fast, but Boston was a big player in those things. And we had a pretty decent sized <coughs> computer. And what it did is it, it did a quick first run on uh, a dividend discount approach that we were doing. Hi, I'm Ralph Powell. Sorry to interrupt your video, I know it's a pain in the ass, but look, I want to tell you something important, is I can tell that you really want to learn about what's going on in financial markets and understand the global economy in these complicated times. That's what we do at Real Vision. So this YouTube channel is a small fraction of what we actually do. You should really come over to realvision.com and see the 20 or so videos a week that we produce of this kind of quality of content, the deep analysis and understanding of the world around us. So if you click on the link below or go to realvision.com, it costs you $1. I don't think you can afford to be without it. And what it did is it, it did a quick first run on uh, a dividend discount approach that we were doing by hand. It made the screening quicker and more efficient. And we, we took everything with us 
to uh, GMO. When we split uh, from Battery March, I think we took uh, seven of the original eight people. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Dean had a, a, another good squad of people to keep going with, but we took the original, the original folk. And uh, I like to say they kept the name and we kept the portfolio. So we took our portfolio onto a different floor of the same building, the Battery March building, and, uh, and, kept, and, kept, and kept running. Uh, Dick Mayo was really the portfolio manager. I was his chief strategist and analyst, and we, we split the role and, uh, and kept going. So I, I had the good fortune of getting to know your two partners in GMO, uh, Ike Van Aderloo, uh, very closely, Dick Mayo, I knew socially when I lived in Boston, um, you know, really a superlative group of talent. And your role as chief strategist has taken on somewhat of a unique dynamic in terms of a, a statesman uh, for sanity in the market uh, over the past 25 years. One of my first remembrances of you was sitting in a uh, uh, conference room, a dining facility at Rose Wharf uh, Hotel, listening to you outline in, I, I want to say it was January 2000, because if I remember correctly, uh, five days later, I attended the roadshow for the AOL acquisition of Time Warner. But you gave a very prescient speech it was similar in some ways to um, what Warren Buffett had outlined in terms of the, the features of mean reversion, that the underlying dynamics were so compelling that this was a bubble, that even when you asked people a question in a crowded facility, you know, what do you think profit margin expectations are? What do you think multiples will eventually return to? What you found was that they would naturally give you answers that said market returns were going to be a disaster going forward. Can you talk a little bit about what that period was like and how it might compare to the experience that we're going through today? It was um, psychologically extremely painful um, because the clients were uniquely vindictive. Neither before nor since have they taken that attitude. There was something about that tech bubble of 99 uh, that made the clients. Uh, talk as if we had personally insulted them. We had deliberately attempted to lose them money. <laughs> in, in other setbacks, that has not been the case. They have mm -hmm. realized that we were trying to do our best and got it wrong. But in that occasion, uh, they, they really were uh, upset. They, and, and the reason they were upset is they completely bought into the new golden era that Alan Greenspan and others were talking about that the internet was going to drive away the dark clouds of ignorance and uh, productivity would go through the roof and stay there forever. <clears throat> Underneath that, everything was exactly the way a value manager would want. There were asset classes that had not participated at all. The US REITs, the REITs, they, um, they yielded 9.1% at the very top of the market when the S&P yielded its all-time low of 1.6%. And I remember people saying, oh, yes, but the S&P has had a higher dividend growth rate than the, than the REITs have had. And we would say, yes, it has indeed. Here are the numbers. Uh, the S&P has had 1% a year faster growth rate in dividend growth and in return, uh, you can have 7% extra cash yield. Uh, take your pick. And uh, the, the gap between value and growth was as extreme as it had been in, in 1974, uh, which is to say about half price. It, it looked like there would be something like 100 percentage points recovery to close the gap. And back in those days, the gap had opened and closed several times. It had been pretty dependable. Uh, small cap against large cap was also as cheap as it had been. So you had value cheap and small cap cheap, REITs off the scale cheap. You had tips um, that had just been introduced. 
and tips yielded four percent real yields. Four percent real yields. I remember them extremely well. Looking at that and thinking, this is completely insane. I'm sorry. <laughs> Continue. And the regular bonds were equally attractive. So it was, uh, in a way, intellectually paradise. It was psychological hell and intellectual paradise because you had all these wonderful, clear opportunities and extreme diversions from the dominant growth stocks. And all you had to do was stay the course, which we were just able to do from a business point of view. We lost tons of business in a remarkably short time. That whole rampaging part of the bull market was only from the end of of 97 when we were very respectable in terms of relative performance. And then you had 98, 99 in the first quarter of 2000. So just two and a quarter years was enough to cost us at least 60% of our asset allocation accounts and a very decent chunk of our value accounts. And um, that, was a, that was a pretty disappointing um, for me. It was much worse than I had expected or had experienced in earlier setbacks and in later setbacks. That, that, was, um, that was really quite vicious to lose that kind of money in two and a quarter years from, from having good performance. Well, one of the things that I thought was also interesting, so, so you hit on what I think are a kind of a couple of key differences um, to this cycle. One is, if I look at this cycle, I find very little that I find attractive to invest in. I don't see much value um, when I look around the globe in terms of asset classes. There may be some opportunities, but I see few. When I look back at that time period, I think part of the nastiness could very well have been the fact that investors like you and I were looking at small value or emerging markets or you know various other components and saying, no, these are absolutely cheap. REITs, you mentioned, uh, I, I remember doing an analysis on a, on a healthcare REIT and coming to the conclusion that either the world was completely insane, you know, either I was completely insane or this was you know, the cheapest stock in the universe that subsequently went up like 800% right after the bubble cracked. So I, you know, might have been correct in my analysis, but you and I were in this odd position where we were looking at things and saying, these are super attractive and those super attractive things kept going down. Right. Um, is it the same this time around? Do you, do you, do you feel the conviction that the, that the street or that investors are missing an opportunity in another sector, or does this feel different? Some of it is similar and some unquestionably is very different. Um, m- most of the fundamental important inputs into the real world are different. I uh, debated Jim Grant uh, almost five years ago, and um, he had me down as a heretic. Actually, he, he described me as an apostate. I'd given up my religion of value because I was arguing that many important things were different. And so many important things are different. You, you really have to look around and hunt uh, for things that are not different. And uh, the, the idea that interest rates would keep declining to almost zero in real terms and sometimes in Europe even below that. That was something we hadn't even dreamt about in the old days. So that was very different indeed. And uh, the rise of the fangs and the intellectual capital, as opposed to the more traditional tangible capital, and how rapidly uh, they rose to uh, preeminence and dominated the uh, old world in in the US. It was creative destruction. Uh, Joseph Schumpeter uh, writ large, much much more impressive creative destruction in this last 20 years than anything he saw, by the way. He he was building his theory in the 1930s and 40s. And, And there was some pretty impressive creative destruction then, but nothing like this. If you look around today, all the dominant ideas and companies have come out of thin air. They've come out of the venture capital industry, uh, to be blunt. 
And uh, the oldest ones are not old. When we were starting GMO, we hired away employee number nine uh, from, uh, from Microsoft. And Apple is approximately the same age, but all the rest of the fangs are a whole lot younger than that. And none of these guys are spin-offs from the General Electrics and the Procter & Gamble's and the IBM's. They're all new. And by the way, just to digress a little bit, the, the wonderful news on vaccines. The, the intellectual heavy lifting of Pfizer was done with a startup German enterprise, which has yet to be approved a single drug. And uh, Moderna in Boston has yet to be approved a single drug. And these are the two front runners in an industry where scale and money and et cetera mean a lot. I mean, what a testimonial to the power of new thinking, new ideas, and new enterprises. So the fangs have really been significantly different. What is similar, however, is that as we sit today, the gap between low growth and high growth stocks is about, once again, as big as it was back then. And uh, that is not the, the same for small cap, but it is absolutely the case uh, for value. And it's the same for value in small caps versus large cap. It's the same everywhere around the world. It's the same value versus growth in emerging or in EFA or in the US. So that, that is very familiar territory. It has run a hell of a long way. And typically that will turn and give quite a few years of outperformance in favor of value stocks, or if you prefer, the more correct definition, in my opinion, is low growth stocks. Now, if you think about that dynamic, because this is one of the things that I struggle with, is you know the idea of, of what, is, what does cheapness represent? I certainly agree on a relative basis that value is very cheap. But I struggle with the with the absolute cheapness that we would have seen in ninety nine two thousand. Like I, I don't see the evidence of that. For me, value has always been you pay for what you get. And so I'm not a great believer in price to book, particularly since book as an accounting entry has been incredibly distorted in the last twenty years. It used to be a pretty good proxy back in the nineties, eighties, seventies, but but not recently. What I've always felt is the best definition of value is a, a dividend discount model that projects earnings into the future, discounts them back according to the quality, with high quality companies having a lower discount rate than junky companies. And what we brought to bear on this 40 years ago almost was we studied the regression rate by type of company we tried to work out on a company specific basis what regression rate they were liable to have if they behaved in the normal way, given their special characteristics. And so uh, we had Microsoft in our value portfolio uh, all the way through the 90s. Uh, we didn't phase it out until uh, June of, of 99 we started to slice it out. We had 12 monthly slices. And by June of 2000, really before the crunch came on Microsoft, we had gotten rid of it. And any system that makes it impossible for you to buy a high quality, high return, stable enterprise, however cheap it is, because it's always going to be a multiple of book, uh, should be taken out and shot. So a quality adjusted, serious dividend discount model better yet, one that does a good job of projecting future earnings um, is, is what you have to use. And if you use those models, you do see, for example, that emerging markets are absolutely cheap. They are relatively as cheap as they have ever been, uh, parallel to one or two other occasions, but if anything, a little bit even cheaper, relatively. And you see that they are uh, absolutely not bad at all. And um, that, that's the group where the absolute price looks appealing. And, and I can anticipate, because uh, I hear it so often, of course, emerging markets always has a, a lot of question marks 
a, a lot of uh, uh, risk questions, a lot of quality questions, a lot of currency questions, and, and so on and so forth. And, and, and it's all true. They've, they've always had those things, but they are highly diversified. You've got you know, 28 countries in the index, and 40% uh, of that is China. And heck, China, the biggest economy in the world, uh, in, in, in uh, inflation adjusted dollars, considerably bigger than the US, growing much faster. Just this year alone, by the way, they've opened up yet another 10% GDP gap. We're minus four and they're plus six. And they're grinding this out. The IMF, as you know, the rest of the guys think that they're going to have to carry a third, about a third of all the growth on the planet on their, on their shoulders. And, uh, and then you have India, who uh, until the recent virus was growing even faster than China and on the cusp of becoming a giant economy and, and interestingly into uh, uh, intellectual capital and, and consulting and the use of real brain power. And then you have interesting, uh, riskier elements, Brazil, Russia, and so on. Um, it really is the future in a world where the developed world has had a growth rate that frankly is slowly but surely unraveling for 40 years. When I came here, the productivity per person hour, uh, to be politically correct, um, was about 3% a year. And now it's down to one. And they'll be lucky to be one in Europe. So uh, growth is not what it was. And then the increase in the workforce has declined. When I got here, it was 1.5% a year. This year, it will be... Uh, 0.2. In 10 years, the US will go negative. Japan has been negative in the growth rate of the workforce for 15 to 20 years. And Europe is, is going negative as we sit. So uh, we're going to have to get used to a GDP growth, which is a whole lot less than we thought. And there'll be a premium on growth. And emerging will have a lot higher top line revenue than the developed world. How do you think about that dynamic, though? Because you mentioned the declining labor force in Europe, Japan, uh, Korea is experiencing this. Most developed countries around the world have this characteristic. The U.S. is somewhat unique, as you point out. We, we do have positive, as long as we continue to experience positive immigration, we'll likely continue to have that. But if I look at China, for example, China actually has it coming from both sides, right? So China is experiencing a decline in their labor force, as well as a decline in the number of hours that they work coming from the highest level of hours per capita. When I look at the factors of production in a place like China, I become very skeptical about the sort of growth forecasts that you're describing under the IMF or the UN. How do you reconcile... Okay, you know, the easiest way for me to think about GDP just very quickly is since it's a production factor, it has to not be based on a GDP per capita. You have to normalize it to workers and hours per worker, effectively going back to your point to a productivity and a baseline type forecast. How do you recon reconcile a favorable view of emerging markets given the reliance on China and their much less favorable dynamic in that framework? I don't think it's much less favorable. It's much less favorable than the emerging market. It's much, much less favorable uh, than Africa and, and decently less favorable than India. What China is looking at in, in population growth is very similar to the developed world. We are suffering a baby bust uh, without precedent uh, throughout the world in, in, in the developed markets. Uh, South Korea is a whole lot worse than China at 1.0 uh, uh, fertility rate when 2.1 is replacement. I mean, it's just hard to get one's brain around that they're losing half the baby cohort every generation, which is to say every 30, 35 years. Uh, Italy is 1.4. Japan is 1.4. China is 1.5, 1.55, which is terrible. Um, the U.S. is 1.70. Um, so, uh, and, 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 uh, there are enough Italy's in the mix 
uh, and, and Hungary is that the growth rate of Europe in population is going to be very similar uh, to China. It's perhaps a little bit higher, but, but not enough to, to count. The US will not have a rising workforce. We were highly unlikely uh, to take uh, immigrants sufficient to, to block our, the drop off in the baby cohort. At 1.7, you're running, you're running 15% plus below replacement. We never take, we haven't taken that level of immigrants for years. And we don't know going forward how, um, how the immigration numbers will hold up, but highly unlikely, I think, uh, to expand uh, enough to, to even get to zero. But yes, you're right, the US will have a slower rate of decline in the workforce over the next 50 years than Europe and China. And, uh, and of course, uh, very much uh, slower than the, the developed world. That becomes one of the more attractive features of the, of the other 60%. So China will have a, a falling workforce and the other 60% will have a rising workforce. And uh, on average, that puts them, <clears throat> even on that issue, way ahead of the uh, developed world. And, and looking at other Chinese virtues, they are attacking, you know I'm a nut, on, on climate change. Uh, the, the whole of the world is going to be green. We're not talking about that. We'll have plentiful green energy. We'll have green efficient machines. We will greenify steel and cement and everything else. The only problem we're dealing with is the time it takes and the uh, damage to the natural systems and, and homo sapiens in, in the time it takes to get the job done. But, but we will do it. It will completely dominate um, the future GDP flows. It will be the biggest shift in the industrial world since coal and oil were introduced. And maybe it will turn out to be even bigger. And uh, it will be tens of trillions of dollars. And uh, there's one way of looking at that. If you invest on the greening of the economy and we get behind it and we do enough to save our bacon, uh, you will make tons more money than betting on the rest of the economy. And if we fail, you're screwed anyway. Uh, it won't matter that your, your green investments have done badly because if we don't get behind climate change and fix it, the, the whole viability of the global system will become uh, a thing of the past. Uh, society after society will become unstable, failing states here and there, bad actors taking advantage of that, and, and it will become very rapidly a new dark ages. And we can do, we can avoid that. We can rise to the occasion. And it will need a fairly massive effort, a kind of Marshall Plan writ large. And there are plenty of countries signing up for that. England just announced, uh, Britain, sorry, that it was going to uh, require nothing but elect electric cars, electric vehicles, in fact, uh, in, in uh, 2035 or 2030, um, around the corner. Uh, China just signed on to the greenest of green uh, objectives for 2060 uh, to be uh, carbon neutral. Uh, China has moved so fast that it dominates solar production. It dominates wind, it's 50% of the global market. It's 80% of solar panels. It's well over half of all the electric cars made uh, are in China. Uh, in, in terms of electric buses, the, the joke is we have 400 in the US and 400,000 in China. We are letting the Chinese in industry after industry get ahead. So even the precious, they're not really precious metals, but but there are metals that are going to turn out to be precious from a green point of view, uh, the, the nickels and the cobalts and the lithiums. Uh, China has a kind of death grip on the production of these things. Uh, they mine some themselves, but those that they don't mine, they ship in from Africa and they process. So they process 80% of the world's cobalt. Uh, they, uh, they process over 50% of the world's nickel. 
uh, and and uh, and lithium. So um, they are setting themselves up uh, to be the powerhouses uh, of the powerhouse of the future. And uh, we are letting this opportunity as semi climate deniers as a country. We're letting these great opportunities uh, slip through our fingers. When you think about that dynamic, the 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 opportunity slipping through your fingers. Um, when I think about things like cobalt processing or nickel processing, while I agree that those metals will play an important role in electrification going forward or further electrification, those are inherently very anti-green activities, right? Processing nickel and processing cobalt are inherently very dirty. Part of the reason China has the advantage there is because they are actually willing to pollute. They are willing to put their population at risk. In the U.S., when you try to navigate through the environmental thicket, it's functionally impossible to have those types of facilities in the United States. Do you think it's important to think of it in the context of the ends justify the means so that you're willing to accept the dirty processing for greater access to the components of electric vehicles and batteries? Or yeah. do you think that's a false dichotomy? No, I, I think... Uh... It's unfortunate that uh, greening the global economy will take lots of nickel and, and lithium and, and probably cobalt, although you can't be sure. Uh, and, and you can try and be less toxic and, and disruptive uh, to nature, but mining is intrinsically a very dirty business. And you could be Simon Pure and say, okay, well, mining is terrible from an ESG point of view, uh, and uh, so we're not gonna do it. If you don't do it, we're doomed. You, you cannot green the economy without copper and nickel and lithium, and, and, and without um, the uh, rare earths. They, they crop up all over wind turbine blades and uh, all over, as it turns out, really quite a coincidence, an unfortunate coincidence, but all over the green technologies are these rare earths. And we simply need them. There is no other way. And um, China has much more than its fair share of the rare earths. It's not just that they are willing to mine them. We're relatively willing to mine them ourselves because they looked very profitable. But we just don't have um, as many good concentrations of rare earths that they have in, in, in China. And, and yes, they are willing to, uh, to pay a high price, just as we were. When we were in the early stages of industrializing our economy, uh, there was nothing dirty enough that we couldn't do. And you could set fire to rivers in America uh, 50, 60, 70 years ago. And the air was incredibly toxic. So we, we paid the price, we made the rush to become a rich country. And frankly, they are doing a hell of a lot better than we did then. In other words, they are addressing their toxic air much quicker and better than we did back in the late 19th century and the early 20th century. And uh, if, if you were their bosses and you had inherited a, a billion poor people and 400 who were million that might be faintly described as middle class, uh, you would say your job number one was to get as many people as you could across the great divide into being relatively well-educated, relatively well-fed and clothed and part of the industrial system. And they have done that. They are now one of the haves as, as opposed to the have-nots. And that's been the greatest uh, increase in well-being in the history of man the speed with which they have moved from 5%, 3% of the coal to 50% of the coal, 4% of nickel to 50% of nickel. Over 50% of every bag of cement on the planet the last year was used in China. Uh, that has all been speed without any precedent at all. And of course it's come with a massive amount of, of pollution. And, and they've generated whole industries of combating water pollution and air pollution 
uh, and, and they continue to do that. So they've had a, a, a creative struggle between making their people rich and educated on one hand and, and poisoning them on the other. And the people who live north of the Great River in, in the cold and get a coal allowance live four years less long than the Chinese south of the river. So they are paying a very high price, but they do know it. They are wall-to-wall -wall PhD scientists at the top of China. Uh, we have one in Congress, and, and uh, I think he's on the medical side. So in terms of PhDs in physics and chemistry, we have none in all the members of Congress or all the members of the administration. Uh, in fact, when they hear the word PhD, they reach for their revolver, it seems. I look at China as actually quite resource poor. I agree with you that they are production rich. Um, but when you phrase it in that way, when you effectively are saying, in order to facilitate the greening, we need massive amounts of nickel and copper. Is this really what's sitting at the core of your emerging value forecast that you're thinking that that commodities are effectively going to make a significant recovery? Is that the is that the right way to think about it? Let me make one thing perfectly clear, as Nick some would say. Um, I, I am not in charge of the portfolios. I'm not an active member of, of the team picking the stocks or doing the analysis and have not been for a, a, a goodly number of years. I did it for a long time. I, I, I felt like I'd paid my dues and uh, I moved from stock picking uh, to quant. And then I, after 15 or 20 years, I moved from quant to asset allocation. There was some overlap. And after 15 years, I moved in, in, into uh, top level issues, studying the top level issues uh, uh, that we face and, 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 and communications, i.e. writing quarterly letters. And, uh, and then in my foundation for the protection of the environment, I've been drawn to venture capital, which is, a, I think, a very special and, and very exciting category. So before I answer the question, and, and, and also as context for everything I've said so far, I am simply not an expert at this kind of stuff. But I do know from the aggregate data that it is not just a resource companies that look cheap. Resource companies, by the way, have always looked cheap. They simply trade uh, uh, cheap. They've done reasonably well because of that. If you look at their long-term 70-year returns, they've really done uh, pretty darn well. But they always look cheap and, and, and for good reasons. They're very cyclical. Uh, no one loves them. In fact, worse than that, everyone hates them, really. And uh, pollution is just one of the reasons uh, to hate them. So yes, they are cheap today, but there are plenty of other things that are cheap, uh, particularly in comparison uh, to the growth stocks that are having one, one more uh, incredible run, which they had several of over, over my career. Step forward a little bit, talking about the asset class forecast type dynamic. And I just want to uh, pause on that for a second and, and ask kind of a broader question about this, this idea of the vision of uh, the opportunity and the greening of the world, effectively the retooling of production characteristics so that we reduce the carbon impact, reduce the pollution impact, et cetera. If I look back at prior periods where we faced these types of challenges, right, the very famous analysis that suggested that London was going to be buried under 13 feet of, you know, horse excrement, um, we have faced those risks and those concerns but the solution set has actually been a dramatic expansion of capabilities. So the introduction of the automobile, for example, radically increased the number of miles that people could transit in any given day and that they did in fact transit in any given day. It solved the last mile problem. It radically lowered issues of reliability. Does your horse come up lame? Do you need a driver? Do you need to give them a break every 15 miles, et cetera, et cetera. When we change those things historically, it's meant a dramatic expansion of the productive frontier, an increase in aggregate capacity in a world that candidly was, was experiencing fairly rapid productivity or population growth, I'm sorry, due to gains in things like antibiotics and uh, sterilization, germ theory of disease, et cetera. 
if I look at replacing coal or natural gas or um, old style nuclear with things like wind and solar, am I actually gaining something in the process? Am I expanding my production frontier to create greater wealth? Or am I simply replacing it in a way that um, is, is not actually an investment, it's, it, it is a cost avoidance is I guess the easiest way to, to think about it. Well, that is a mouthful, yes. no question uh, about that. Um, first, let's get it on the table that productivity has been declining for 50, 60 years, fairly steadily. Yep. And, and the economists pull on their beards and uh, exchange uh, reasons uh, but have by no means ag agreed on why that is the case. Uh, the one I lean to is you start with the most available important ideas and, and you work your way down the list and second and third derivative ideas are not going to uh, be as powerful as the steam engine. And the steam engine uh, had, had to be combined with coal and oil to really count. Um, I do think it's hard to separate technology from luck. And uh, to give you recent examples, we, we in the US and the UK are failing the social contract test that is COVID. It's a wonderful test. It needs an efficient government, administration, and all its tentacles, regulations, and some countries have it and some do not. It needs an efficient public to behave in a responsible way. Some countries have it and some do not. Some have good scores in both. Then you have Japan who they believe the general public that their government has been completely incompetent. They have the lowest approval rate of any country anywhere. Uh, along with the, the, the Spanish and so on, who've really suffered. But the Japanese have not suffered. They are, you know, 5% of the death rate per capita of the US with the oldest population in the world. How is this possible? It's because the Japanese social contract is so strong. They behave all the time as if society matters, as if their neighbors matter. Uh, they always, they're compulsively clean and wash their hands all the time. They always wear masks at the drop of a hat. They do what they're told. They have a thoroughly Confucian uh, attitude to respect for authority, science, and everything else. And they wish that the authorities had been competent, but they were not. But they alone were enough. And then you have countries where the public have been terrible, like the US, where we're fighting for the right to drive drunk, as it were, uh, somehow conflating the idea that personal liberty can allow you to do things like drunken driving that are dangerous to your neighbor. Uh, as if it was something like wearing a seatbelt. You know, that doesn't hurt your neighbor. Be my guest, don't wear a seatbelt. Uh, and you may die, but that's your problem. That is your, that's rugged individualism. I, I respect that. But to drunk, to drive drunk because it's your divine right to be rugged individual and, and kill a few people, that is not kosher. And not wearing a mask is on the wrong side of rugged individualism and utter selfishness. And we have failed that test. They have failed it in the UK. We have battled out to see who will have the lowest percentage of mask wearing in the general public, even when the virus is everywhere. And we pay a terribly high price. We don't do tracking very well. We don't do testing very well. We haven't moved very quickly. We made incredible mistakes at the beginning. We have done nothing right as a government, nothing right as a public, and other countries have completely nailed this thing. And coming to our rescue, by luck, is going to be a series of wonderful vaccines, which everybody who knows anything about vaccines knew was not certain. It was absolutely not guaranteed that any vaccine would be very effective against COVID. And we are going to have several that will be off the scale effective. And it will save us from ourselves. We have failed the test. 
we were going to grind on miserably, both from economic effect and, and semi-lockdowns here and there forever. This thing was going to come back year after year, and we were going to lose in deaths per million uh, more than all but a handful of unfortunate countries out of the 200. I think the US is number 12. The Brits today are number eight from the worst. Um, and we've been saved. Climate change, if we're lucky, will be the same. If climate change solutions required an enormous cost, we would not pay them based on, on the evidence so far. We are only willing uh, to adopt uh, efficient antidotes to climate change because by some miracle, the technology has moved so much faster than anyone thought that it is simple economic sense to have windmills in Texas and, and offshore East Coast and all over the North Sea, et cetera, et cetera. Electric cars are already for the last couple of years, much cheaper to run, much cheaper to maintain. And in a couple of years, they will be cheaper to produce. And that is a given. So we are dead lucky. I, I, I tell you, let me summarize it this way. If we had the world's population today and the world's problems, and we had the technology of 1900, we would be toast. We would have no hope. If on the other hand, we had today's technology and the global population of 1900, we would have no problem. We would cruise to success, if you will. We would brush aside uh, these problems. Do you think that's actually a fair comparison? And so I, I would highlight, for example, that if we had the technology of the 1900s, um, we wouldn't have the number of 80 plus year olds to die in the coronavirus dynamic. This is a, by and large, a pandemic that in almost any other period in history, there wouldn't have been enough people with the comorbidities that dominate the fatalities associated with coronavirus that we would have really even noticed. It would have been what was described as a hard winter. Yes, I was attempting to make that comparison on climate change, by the way. But, yeah. Uh, so but you're right. Um, so that, when, I, that, when I think about those dynamics, right, I, I tend to be more hopeful or um, less random in the application of technology and innovation and instead suggests that it emerges in response to the necessities. And so if the opportunity exists to very profitably address the dynamics of climate change, then that innovation will emerge in places that reward that innovation. For example, the United States, I would suggest we've seen exactly that dynamic in the vaccines where you have ultimately seen the vaccines emerge in a society that by nature was chaotic. And that chaos in many ways contributes to the innovative dynamics. Well, just to take that last point, the intellectual effort uh, on, on Pfizer comes from a, a German startup, a few years old, run by two pe people of Turkish, uh, Turkish German, if you will, and they have not a single registered uh, uh, drug any more than Moderna has a single registered drug. So the heavy lifting here is being done in testimonial to the importance of creative destruction and new enterprise uh, by a brilliant German startup and a brilliant Boston startup, uh, and not the Mercks and Lilies of the world who are coming along in the background and may get there one day. Uh, the, the idea that uh, whenever you have a problem, uh, we rise to the occasion has to deal with history. Uh, you have a bubonic plague. Rather more recently, we had a terrible flu that killed 60 million in, in uh, 1918, 1919. Uh, where, where was the brilliant uh, vaccine then? Unfortunately, it was several decades away intellectually. And that's my point about 1900. You can't get blood out of a stone if, you're, if your scientific world is on the cusp of dealing with RNA, which ours was. And uh, you, you are dead lucky uh, and uh, you take advantage of it. But if you were trying hard with the science of 1900, brilliant people around, you're out of luck. You are not going to have a vaccine for COVID-19. You needed uh, all the decades in between of steady work. 
This is not done because they are responding to the challenge. This is done because for the last 20 years, they have had amazing series of breakthroughs uh, in dealing with uh, RNA and messenger RNA, and they were all set to go. And um, I, I, I think it's, um, it's a big mistake to think you can't have disasters. You have dark ages, you have terrible plagues, things go terribly wrong. And sometimes the Roman Empire, as it were, can rise to the occasion and can build enormous viaducts to ship water to where it's needed and can colonize uh, the Egyptians to produce the corn that Rome needed. And sometimes they can't. They erode their soils, they lose their fertility, the barbarians come, they're hollowed out, and the empires fail. And empires, the great empires, the ones that lasted for hundreds of years, all failed one by one as some combination of ills overtook them. And they were homo sapiens. They were brilliant. They were resourceful. They were the same people that we are. And yet bad things happened to them and brought them down. And to think that we will not was a feeling felt actually for a long time in the Roman Empire. We have overcome the barbarians. We have overcome the Huns and the Goths and so on. We have overcome uh, the erosion of, of the fertility of Italy. We've overcome all manner of problems. And uh, we're here after 600 years. We will surely be here forever. And, and they were not. And, and, and in America, you're sitting on a 300-year uh, enterprise. Uh, nothing like the Mayans, by the way. Uh, one or two of, of their cities states lasted for a 1,000 years. And then they fell. So uh, it, it's easy to think because you're doing well that, that it's by divine right, if you will, that it will always happen. But it flies in the face of history. History says you do well when you're doing well, and when you run out of luck, you fail. So you always try your hardest, and you hope to extend your empire from 300 years to 600 years to 1,000 years. You go as long as you can, uh, and you always prepare for the worst. I actually am not implying that you can always rely on that, but I guess the question that I would ask is in that framework, do most of those empires succeed or fail? Uh, do they succeed or fail at a higher or lower rate depending on how they value effectively human capital, right? The way I would describe it in the United States is that we place a high value on human capital and therefore liberate individuals to pursue their individual interests. Whereas a more collectivist, as you highlight Confucian type society, would view those resources as available to the central planners or to the emperor to achieve the objectives of the collective. My analysis would suggest- know enough, enough. So please, <laughs> yes. <laughs> That is, that is such a, a uh, you specialize in these, uh, these uh, compound and complicated questions. questions. Yes. I mean, th this is life and death. Let me say this. I, I don't believe in American exceptionalism except in one way. In, in, in the recent decades, the U.S. has been exceptionally bad. <laughs> but there is an exception uh, to that comment. And that is venture capital, risk taking, and great research universities, which are actually very closely uh, uh, allied to each other. Uh, venture capital really depends on a lot of great research universities. You have something in America like 15 out of 20 of the great research universities, and most of the rest are in, in, in Britain. However, you also have a long tradition of risk-taking and honoring risk-taking, which other than Israel, who, who does it at least as well on a per capita basis, they have an even bigger and better venture capital industry than we do. It's just so tiny, it doesn't really count, except perhaps in agriculture. But, so that is impressive. There is no question, venture capital is, spectacularly, in my opinion, in good shape. American capitalism is, I think, rather fat and happy, monopolistic, slow to take risks compared to the old days. There aren't as 
there are half as many people involved in companies one and two years old than there were in 1970. This is not as dynamic as you think. It is carried by relative handfuls of, of brand new ideas. And that's why I'm such a devotee these days uh, to, uh, to venture capital. It's where all of the action is. It's where all the brightest people go. It, it, it has them straight out of the great research universities. And it really is exceptional. Having said that, who is the second largest venture capital country in the world by far? There's no one in third place, China. Mm -hmm. Who is the fastest growing by far in amount? China. In biochemistry, you know, they have multi-billion dollar companies. In, in, in uh, communication apps, shall we call it, they have the biggest companies in the world. Um, and, and tens of billions of dollars of value attached to them. And uh, yes, they are notionally capitalist in a way, but there are very large elements of, of uh, uh, the central planning also that stopped the, the Mr. Ma's uh, public issue, IPO the other day, uh, on the drop of a, of a hat. Um, but their venture capital industry is closing the gap. I will guarantee you that in 20 years, they will have halved the gap between the US and China in terms of the number and size of their venture capital industry. They are a real threat. And one of the other aspects of society is education. Do not think for a second that the poor country of China with 1.4 billion is less well-educated than the average American. It simply is not anymore. Their ability in the big cities, uh, are they have considerably better average science tra training than we do. They have moved their way up the ranking just as the US has been sliding. We're something like 28th in, in, in science now and math, uh, in quantitative, I believe is, is the description. And, and that's down from six or seven uh, when I got here. Uh, long ago. So we're not making a lot of progress in some of the things that really, really count. And that is, that is the more standard pattern. Our capitalism isn't too good. Corporations have too much political influence and monopolies uh, are no longer uh, fought. Uh, they acquire too big a, a market share. We're paying a fairly high price. Uh, and that is offset by a handful of new enterprises that have sprung out of the VC industry. None of them owe anything to what I'd call the established uh, American capitalist system of 1960. None of them sprung out of Triple M or IBM or, or um, Johnson & Johnson. They're all new enterprises. So that is very much an exception to a rather sad story of general decline in, in social conditions. Our murder rate, is the worst in the developed world. Our life expectancy, it's the only developed country that has been declining, undeniably declining for the last three years. And over 20 years has lost ground against the rest of the developed world. In fact, if you take the G20 and you take the 10 uh, developed countries and there are 10 uh, Chinas and Indias and so on, undeveloped, we are 10th uh, in, in that area. We are 10th in life expectancy out of 10. Uh, we're 10th in, in, uh, in, in too many of those things um, uh, to make one feel comfortable. Yeah, I'm not sure we're going to make um, a ton of progress on this. Um, I'm not actually arguing for American exceptionalism as much as I'm arguing for a process exceptionalism, right? Is, is messy better than planned? Um, I like a world that has lots of small experiments, and I would echo many of your concerns that you're highlighting about the monopolistic characteristics of U.S. commerce, precisely because it tends to limit the number of experiments that go on, right? If you have one giant search engine company, you're not going to see the same level of innovation and experimentation as if you have 50 of them, because the monopolist is basically behaving in a very different fashion. COVID. 19 has been a really good test of messy yeah. versus et cetera. You know, in, in, in Taiwan, 
they have had um, seven deaths in a population of 20 million. Uh, and, and, you know, we have multiples of that in Bristol County, Massachusetts. Yep. Um, it, it, it's an astonishing difference. And, and that was non-messy. That was very neat and tidy, but it was capitalist. It was not done or in an authoritarian way like their neighbors in the rest of China. They've had one-tenth of the per capita death rate of China. China has had better than one-tenth of our death rate, meaning that Taiwan, of course, is much better than 100. It's actually a thousandth of the death rate of Massachusetts. If Massachusetts were a single country, it would be the worst country in the world. And almost every listener is saying, that can't possibly be true. Check it. Johns Hopkins, every morning I sit in bed, I check it. It's 1,500 per million in, in uh, Massachusetts. The worst country is Belgium, which is 1,200. And Taiwan is 0.3 people versus, versus 1,600 in, in New Jersey. So when you think about that type of dynamic, the fact that we have failed this test, is that a is that an opportunity or is that a warning for the future as you think about the forward forecast i think it's a terrible warning because i think most of the time capitalism has been a series of small focused events which are best handled in a messy disorganized system the problems we face today um, can only be dealt with uh, collectively they are climate change, where you need leadership and you need regulation. They are COVID-19, where you need that leadership and, and, and uh, well-organized uh, standard blocking and tackling, which we, seemed, we seem to be incapable of doing. Uh, we have toxicity in the system, which is ruining the fertility of Homo sapiens and undermining the viability of the natural system. And, and that needs regulation. Let me talk a second about regulation. We have 10,000 chemicals in US cosmetics, many of them toxic, almost none of them tested. And of those 10,000, seven have been banned, seven out of 10,000. In Canada, 500 have been banned. And in Europe, in the EU, 1,600 have been banned. And what is happening, among other things, is uh, are these, chemical, these chemicals are, are hitting our fertility. And as I like to say, we apparently are willing to put the intellectual capital of the chemical companies ahead of our sperm cap. And this is a very tough choice to make, but it's one we're making. So these existential threats are all quite different from the normal run-of-the-mill capitalist challenge. When I think about that type of analysis, just very quickly though, I mean, Europe banned 1,600 chemicals, the United States banned seven. Does Europe have much higher fertility, sperm counts, fecundity than the US? What is happening is that it's only in the last 15 years that our sperm count reached a level that began to matter. We were like a good Victorian bridge like the Golden Gate Bridge, hugely over-engineered. So as we declined the first 60%, uh, nobody, nobody noticed, nobody really cared. And we came down from uh, 100 units uh, to uh, 50. And, and then trouble started. And from 50 to 40 over the last 15 years, we've gone from almost nobody having problem to 15% of young couples having problems uh, 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 being fertile. And, and at the rate we're declining, 1.9% a year, where the, the lead authors of the main report say, with no signs of deceleration yet, uh, at this rate in 15 years, the median young couple, the one in the middle, will need help uh, to get fertile. I mean, this is diabolical. It's only in the last 15 years that you begin to see the difference, to answer your question, between the US and the rest of the developed world. Yes, we are looking worse. Yes, it is reflected, among other things, in morbidity and mortality. 
our life expectancy is dropping off and, and theirs is still growing. So yes, there are differences. And if we keep on this path, the differences will widen very rapidly. I, I think toxicity in the system and its effect on humans will become one of the big issues of, of the immediate future. And it will have some dire consequences for the chemical industry, uh, just as climate change has had for the oil industry. Oil industry over, over the last dozen years have been decimated, literally decimated. They went from 16% of the S&P uh, 12 years ago to 2.5% uh, yesterday. So this Biggest loss in, uh, in history. This is something that you've been very much ahead of the curve on, is, is looking at the oil story from a political restriction side that ultimately it wasn't just about the peak oil dynamics. It was largely about the peak demand components that is, that is I would argue, has begun to dominate the discourse. As you, as you think about what the world looks like going forward, do you think we're going to have 0% fossil fuels in the S&P 500, and that that will ultimately be replaced by the Teslas and the sun powers, et cetera, of the world, the first solars? Or is yeah. this a, um, is, is energy never going to play that type of role again? Fossil fuel energy is never going to play that role again. Um, in terms of energy, it will basically be out of the equation in, in, in 30 years. And since big commodity industries are always played on the margin, that means hell on wheels, as you know, for, for profit margins and capital spending and all the rest of it. They will still be a supplier of petroleum products for much longer, uh, but um, maybe another 30 years beyond that will, will gut um, the demand uh, for uh, for uh, petroleum, for plastics, and uh, and chemicals, and uh, and other uses. So yes, they're on their way out. And what is interesting is how the marketplace played that. In the last dozen years, there was never a point where you could pick up and read a headline that the oil industry was under terrible problem. It ebbed and flowed like normal. You couldn't see much difference. You had gluts. You had shortages et cetera, et cetera, business as usual. But at the end of the 12 years, it was no longer uh, the oil industry that we knew. Exxon, biggest company in the world uh, uh, 12 years ago or thereabouts. And now it's less uh, market cap than Tesla. Quite a bit less. It's been kicked out of the Dow. So it's- uh... <laughs> Kicked out of the Dow, right. Just as Tesla gets kicked into the S&P, yeah. Yes, it's, it's quite, it's quite... Uh, telling in terms of the underlying dynamics. If I think about the way that I'm hearing what you're saying to me, and I just want to want to clarify this, it's that as you look at the next 20 or 30 years, truly critical in your view of success going forward is going to be the role of a directed state enter activity that, that as a group will have to find a way to be cohesive and unite in our direction. Is that, is that a fair interpretation? Because that, that, that's different than the historical framework. That would be a substantive change. Yes, it would. Yeah, no, paradise for me would be a vital venture capital industry, much better funded even than it has been. Doubles, triples, quadruples of money coming in an R&D budget that is funded both through venture capital and through corporations and through government at much higher levels, combined with uh, a sensible long-term oriented set of realistically scientific-based um, regulations designed uh, to get us uh, to a suitable place in the distant future and not a series of ad hoc 18 month plans uh, that, that dominate uh, politics and, and, and business as usual. And, um, and thirdly, a, a retooling of the social contract. Everybody seems to agree that from FDR on, the social contract improved, equality improved, educational standards shot up, health shot up for everybody, 
And then around 1965, 1970, it began to swing the other way. Inequality widened back now uh, to back to the kind of gilded age of the 1880s, about as unequal as it has ever been, and certainly more unequal than other developed countries, more unequal than China, incidentally. And along with that came worse average health, the only country in the developed world that doesn't have universal health care as kind of a right of an individual, along with universal education, the right to decent health and, and decent education, you'd think would be, would be bare bones. And they are, from Canada to Uruguay and everyone in between, they are basic rights except in the US. And that has to be retooled because that inequality has eaten away at the social contract to such a degree uh, that nobody uh, will, will concede anything uh, in the interests of their neighbors. It's look after yourself and to hell with the town you're in, to hell with your, your, your state, uh, maximize your short-term profits. And Milton Friedman has a lot to answer for. The only social responsibility, he says, of a corporation is to maximize its damn profits. If you define that as a human being, my only social responsibility is to look after myself, you'd say, well, that's a workable definition of being a sociopath. So we have sociopathic corporations. They deny that tobacco kills you. They deny that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, even though their scientists in the 60s and 70s wrote peer-reviewed articles at Exxon saying it was going to be a, a really serious problem. They put their money into denying it. They deny that chemicals are, are ruining our toxicity. They lobby so competently that they basically control the organizations uh, that uh, regulate them. It can't get much worse than this. And we have to change that or it will end badly. I think that's a really important message. It's one that you and I both share, um, which is I think that the regulatory, the dynamics of regulatory capture and the incentive structures, you highlight Milton Friedman and the rise of you know, the shareholder focused corporation in the 1980s, 1990s. You know, I agree with you very much. I think that that is a substantive risk and regular viewers know that the area that I focus, and you obviously know this as well, the area I focus most on in that context is the rise of passive investing, the abrogation of the responsibilities of corporate ownership that that often entails and the dynamics around capital allocation. So I, I share many of your concerns on that. If we were to steer this in a slightly different, perhaps more hopeful direction, what, what do you think is the most important message you would share with a young person evaluating a career in finance today or in markets today? How, how, would, what, how would you advise my son, for example? What would, your, what would your recommendations be? And I do get asked this surprisingly often recently. It, it must be something to do with uh, COVID and, and seclusion and contemplation. People seem to be more thoughtful about a lot of things. And um, I, I obviously have a very strong response uh, that's focused on, on venture capital. Because although we try our hardest, the rest of us money managers are shuffling pieces of paper around. And, and it was fun and it was intellectually challenging and it was competitive and it got the juices going, but it's, it's not changing much. We don't produce any widgets. We, we shuffle the future stream of claims on those widgets around in a cosmic game of poker. And if you're a good poker player, you inflict your cost of doing business on the enemy. So he has to pay for his cost of business or she and your cost of business and you have to have a little alpha left over. It's, it's a high hurdle. And that's why uh, that's been the attraction of, of, of passive investing is just as a way of reducing the friction and the management fees. But venture capital is absolutely different. It's part, it is the creative destruction. It, it's the driving force, the juice in the system that changes everything. And I know you, you are big on, on technology and innovation as I am. So we overlap in a few areas. And um, so I would say for heaven's sake, if you, if you mean to get into business, aim for venture capital. Either start your own firm, 
having received the right training at least to get going or, or work for a venture capital enterprise, but be involved in the generation of new ideas and, and new engineering, new technologies. It's, it's exciting, it's important. Uh, you can save the planet, you can make a lot of money. What's not to like about it? I think that's a, I think that's a fantastic uh, piece of recommendation. I, I genuinely hope that much of our industry can become focused on that idea of value creation. Um, and I share your sympathies, your, I, I sympathize with your concerns about the dynamics of shuffling around pieces of paper in secondary markets. One of the things that I find most fascinating is, is that our activities are largely designed to set the marginal cost of capital. And yet many American corporations, the best thing they can find to do with their money is to buy back their own shares. So we're really not fulfilling a particularly important role if that is their primary activity. They don't need additional capital unless they're prepared to invest it. What, what is so convenient for them is um, the accounting regulations. If they start 100 enterprises what used to be considered the kind of triple M, 3M style. Um, some fail and have to be written off, some succeed and give you a, a glitch in your earnings. It's rather messy. It's all income transaction. If you wait and you buy the survivors out of venture capital, it's a capital transaction. You know exactly what you're spending. You haven't taken any write, write offs. You go in, you take a much lower risk winner, and of course you, you get a slightly lower return for that, but from a career point of view, it's so manageable, you think it's a bargain. And uh, you use the rest of your cash flow to buy stock back because you know what you're getting, it's easily manageable, et cetera, et cetera. So you have smooth, low volatile, low risk for you as an individual, as an executive, and, and it's a perfect situation. Doing it yourself is risky. And so we have a nice situation arising where more and more corporations want to buy venture capital companies when they've proved themselves and creating a wonderful market for venture capitalists. So that's cool. Yeah, I mean, the, the most active in that have been the US technology giants, right? Google makes an acquisition a day, basically. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how that's affected by the potential change in the regulatory framework, in particular antitrust investigations around that. But but I, I tend to agree with you that I, I do think the opportunity for younger people is not necessarily to sit in the seats that you and I occupied, but more to sit in the in a role of creation. I mean, the the, the real shortage that we have today, and you highlighted some of these dynamics, are the dynamics of labor force mobility and innovation. I mean, the staggering statistic associated with the GI Bill is that 46% of the recipients of the GI Bill founded their own company. That sort of statistic doesn't remotely exist in any part of American society or global society for that matter today. And so I, I, I would be hopeful, not necessarily they have to go into venture capital, but I do hope that we create the opportunities for entrepreneurship. And coronavirus has been an interesting experience that may have opened up some of those opportunities. I don't know yet, but I, that, that would be where I would be hopeful. At the Grantham Foundation, we've targeted 70% uh, to be early stage venture capital, which of course is a uniquely high and illiquid and difficult to manage uh, fraction. But my God, it's exciting because some of that we administer ourselves in, in green mission-driven uh, venture capital. We have a, a very hardworking, very smart little team of our own. And uh, so we see firsthand these great scientists from MIT and Caltech and so on, and entrepreneurs, and sometimes the same people, uh, and, and the ideas that they have. Uh, you know, ways of sequestering carbon at uh, $15 a ton, you know, if it works. W ways of making RNA down from $1,000 a gram to 35 cents a gram. That, that's a real story that we have invested in, a Boston-based enterprise. 
called Greenland, and, and so on and so forth. It, if you want to uh, have some excitement to get you out of bed in the morning, uh, those kind of things will do it. And I am uh, privileged, uh, thrilled actually, to have uh, reached a, a relatively old age and, and have so much, so much excitement going on around me. Well, I, I will wrap on actually that point because we're privileged and amazed that we have had the opportunity to have you join us. I agree with much more um, of your views, I think, than, than might have come through in this interview. But I, I would really like to emphasize kind of that positive aspect at the end, which is we all have the opportunity to contribute to this sort of technological breakthrough, whether that's through educating our children, whether that's through our investment process, whether that's through the career choices we make, and it's exciting to have somebody of your stature and your resources pushing us forward in that direction. So from that standpoint, I definitely want to say thank you, Jeremy. Well, it was a pleasure. And thank you for having me. Jeremy, this was, this was fantastic. I look forward to the opportunity to have a conversation with you again. Um, and hopefully at some point in the future, we get to bring in some additional uh, individuals from GMO, if there's anyone that you would love to, to recommend to us to talk to, I would really appreciate that as we continue to extend this series in conversation. Okay, I'll think about that. Jeremy, thank you very much for joining us. I look forward to talking to you again soon. I hope you enjoyed this special episode of the interview, the premier business and finance series in the world. However, this is just the tip of the iceberg. For more in-depth content and expert analysis, Visit the membership link in the description to unlock a week's access for only $1. This dollar can change your life.